Watch this. It seems like it's been full steam ahead for a proposed wind farm in the Magic Valley, but a new budget bill in Congress could bring that plan to a standstill. The latest on the Lava Ridge Wind Project. Any potato is an honorable and delicious potato. I, you know, they're all good. Well, that's a very political way to put it, but that's not how Maine thinks its spuds stack up against Idaho's. We've got a little congressional competition that's continued for decades. Dispatchers, they often meet people over the phone in the middle of their worst moments. But once in a while, they have a hand in helping someone in one of their best moments. And sometimes, it happens more than once. Well, just to let you know, we are awaiting a special report from NBC News with President Biden at the NATO summit. That could come at any moment, and we will go to it when it does. But until then, global warming, climate change, well, that's been a NATO topic for the last several summits. Harnessing renewable green energy has been the goal of environmentalists for decades. A battle, though, over such a source has been brewing for years in southern Idaho. Since 2020, the Lava Ridge Wind Project has been a highly debated topic centered on whether or not to allow a proposed wind farm to be built on public BLM lands in the Magic Valley. Now, there's been a lot of pushback, specifically from friends of Minidoka, the survivors and descendants of the World War II incarceration camp nearby, and every one of Idaho's congressional delegation, which is why they all crafted the Don't Do It Act last year to try to keep it from happening. But while that legislation is being considered, there's a new boost of energy to bring it to a full stop. Hunter Funk brings us the details of a proposed budget bill that could blow the project back to square one. There's a new roadblock taking shape for the large wind project that's had its eyes on the Magic Valley for four years. Congressman Mike Simpson took to Twitter saying, quote, from the beginning, I've made it clear that the Lava Ridge wind project is out of touch and has no place in Idaho. Now, this comes after he added a provision to the Interior Environment and Related Agencies Appropriations Act for 2025. Now, the Lava Wind Project is a proposed wind energy plant that wants to build turbines in Jerome, Lincoln, and Minidoka counties. The Bureau of Land Management is the group conducting a report on what it would do to the environment. The senior director of the proposed wind project responded saying in part, quote, This project can help meet the significant demand for domestic clean energy in Idaho and the western United States. It went on to say the BLM addressed stakeholder concerns and made significant modifications to the project. Which is true. In June, BLM cut the project in half from 400 turbines to 241, capped the maximum height to 660 feet, and moved the wind farm nine miles away from the visitor center for the Minidoka National Historic Site. The Idaho Conservation League says they were satisfied with the adjustments and now worry about the provision. We were disappointed to see the uh, budget rider pass through the House. Uh, BLM has conducted a years-long process incorporating uh, thousands of stakeholder comments and was really responsive to them in their final project. We looked at the final proposal from BLM and weighed thoroughly you know, the project impacts, concerns, mitigations, and all the rest to ultimately decide that we, this is a project that we can and should support. In short, Congressman Simpson's provision says the final environmental impact statement for the Lava Ridge Wind Project issued by the Bureau of Land Management shall have no force or effect. Well, what does that mean? Well, the Bureau of Land Management is expected to release a final statement outlining the impact of the proposed wind project on the environment. Simpson couldn't do an interview today, but he did say if the bill is passed in the Senate and House, it would block that statement, which could put a stop to the proposed Lava Ridge plan entirely. So you have the support from some, but there is a lack of support from lawmakers and the community it would be put in. To be clear, nothing is set in stone. It would need to pass the House and Senate. And we were talking about this before, the fact, I mean, what are the chances that it doesn't pass the House and then the Senate and it gets signed by the president? It is a budget bill, an appropriations bill, but it's such a small part of that thing. Yeah. Like page 69 of like, I mean, hundreds, hundreds of pages. Yeah. It's really long. I mean, yeah, and you're right. Like it could just get str struck out. Somebody could find it and be like, I don't want that in there. Right. Well, Very again, easy. we'll yeah. see how that happens. All right, mm -hmm. thank you very much, Hunter. Okay, so for 911 dispatchers, they get a stork pin every time they successfully help deliver a baby over the phone. It's a way to celebrate that birth. But not every dispatcher picks up a call like this and gets one of these pins. But for one Ada County dispatcher, well, he seems to be the baby magnet. Aspen Shumpert caught up with him about his most recent miracle delivery. 
911, what's the address of your emergency? Tim Simmons has been a 911 dispatcher for over 30 years. He took the job after an injury in the military forced him to get a sit down job. In 911, every time something happens, you just have to figure out how to roll with it until the help gets there. The initial first responders, when a 911 call comes in, they're delegating their response and deciding what to do in a number of highly stressful situations. You go from zero to 110 instantly, and then back to zero with the reports. It's constantly back and forth. There's days you go home and you're just shaking from, from what you've been through. On a bad day, keep to myself, talk to the dog. But not every day is a bad day. June 7th was a day Simmons got to file away in his memory bank. I was early in the morning. The voice behind the call, a CUNA area father. He said, we're not going to make it to the hospital. We're having a baby, and it's, I think it's going to come right now. Simmons got the EMT started. I could hear his wife in the background. Uh, she was obviously having contractions. He walked them through delivery protocols. Right here in section six, where it says, as you're delivering the baby, support the baby's head and shoulders and hold its hips and legs firmly. And remember, the baby's going to be slippery. All before paramedics could get there. A miracle. Right as that baby came out and we heard it cry for the first time, he started to break down just a little bit. I could hear it in his voice. And then he, he came right back with me as I'm talking to him. And I, I'm telling him, now tell your wife she's doing a good job. And in this case, the firemen walk in and they say, OK, what's going on? And he goes, oh, we just had a baby. And I hear them say, already? <laughs> this was the six baby Simmons had delivered over the course of his dispatch career. These kind of calls are like the highlight. Uh, they're, they're amazing. When it all goes well and you hear that baby cry at the end. And Before saying goodbye to the couple that day, Simmons wanted to know one last thing. He told me it was a boy and I said, well, congratulations. And tell your wife, I said, congratulations. I disconnect and then I'm just like, deep breath. <sighs> okay. Now, these six babies he's delivered over the phone is not only the time he's done this. Simmons shared with us he's actually been on the other side of the same situation and hand delivered his own daughter and her son, his grandson, Brian. Wait, what? Yeah. Like, not just dispatch where that just kind of fluke random phone call, but he's been there for the delivery. Of really? Yeah, that's right. Wow, that's yep. amazing. Okay, so what about the couple that called in? I'm sure they didn't have to do this before. I mean, they. This was unique to them, but this wasn't their first kid? That's right. This is actually their second, and that's part of the protocol that Simmons had to ask. Is this your first or your second? Because that's going to affect the time on how quickly the baby comes. True. So this was their second. This was their second. All right. Thank you very much, Aspen. Nice story. So we've seen wildfire smoke increase across the region over the past 48 hours. So that is leading to views like this over in McCall in the morning. It started off a little less hazy, but now in these afternoon hours, we're seeing a little bit less of the blue sky. So all in all, if you're going camping this weekend, unfortunately, I don't have the best forecast for you because tomorrow those hazy conditions look to continue. And then for some mountain areas, as we get closer to the weekend, we have some chances for dry thunderstorms. And so those have the possibility of creating lots of lightning and some of that lightning may start new fires across the area. So that's something that we will continue to have to check also. That's now taking the forefront of what's been the big story is those temperatures. So even in mountain areas, we're expecting those highs to be in the 90s and the lows in the 50s. And so the forecast in the mountains really encapsulates all the things that we're tracking right now. The scorching temperatures, changes in air quality because of the wildfire smoke, and also changes to fire danger that, again, look to ramp up even more so this weekend. So right now we are in the triple digits across valley areas, up to 105 over in Ontario, and again, close to the 90s in several mountain spots and close to the triple digit mark over in the Magic Valley. So overall, as you're making your plans for tomorrow, we've been talking about the, the high temperatures being especially warm, but now even the low temperatures are going to start to get closer to 70 degrees in valley areas. And then all in all, another very hot day ending in the triple digits for us with lighter winds. So what's been driving the especially hot temperatures is the high pressure ridge that is making a very slow passage to the east and continuing to bring us those hot temperatures. And the changes for some of these storm chances will come from the monsoonal moisture that will go along the flow of this high pressure ridge, bringing that right into our area. So that's what's leading to some of those storm chances. And as we look at some of the model data, just know that you won't see a whole lot of precipitation happening. But the, again, the biggest threat with this is going to be lots of lightning. And so you won't see a whole lot of storm coverage, but lots of isolated storms like this. But we will see additional cloud cover at that time. 
and these storms will stay on the dry side. So overall, as we look to tomorrow, you'll notice again those high, those low temperatures getting even warmer. We'll have more of the smoky conditions for uh, the valley areas and really across the area. We'll kind of across the region. We'll see the, the the changes in smoke fluctuate throughout the day. And again, even those low temperatures starting to get a little bit warmer for the mountain areas in the 50s expected for the West Central Mountains and for valley areas. We're looking now more towards the mid 60s to 70 degree range and the low expected to be 70 degrees over in Boise tomorrow. All in all in your seven day forecast, not a whole lot of cooling. I mentioned the dry thunderstorm chances that we have uh, through the weekend. This will be a little bit more focused for the mountain areas, but we can't rule it out just yet for the valleys. We'll continue to track that for you, but you can see a little bit more of those clouds mixing in at times. So hopefully giving us a little bit of shade through this very hot stretch. All right, so the 411 is kind of a place where we like to put some stories that can't really or don't really fit in the rest of the part of the rest of the show. So we try to squeeze them into one little segment, give you updates on things that we've talked about previously. So that's kind of what we're doing today. We got a few updates on some of those stories we have told you about previously. Like many of you have been wondering about the union block building. What's the latest with that? We also have the latest version of Idaho Central Credit Union's agreements. We talked about that and what people can use their money to buy with those agreements. Hunter Funk tells us about those and more in today's 411. Monday night, Boise City Council approved $150,000 to hire an engineer to look at the Union Block building. It's to examine the structural concerns of the historic building. It's been blocked off since November because it was found unsafe and now is in the hands of the city after the owner didn't make the proper repairs. Idaho Central Credit Union is making changes to its e-branch agreement again. Earlier this week, we told you about a former member who pointed out some of the odd details in a recent terms and conditions agreement. The company's CEO sent a letter to its members yesterday explaining the changes. The letter says in part, quote, ICCU members can use their accounts, including mobile banking, to purchase legal goods and services, including firearms, ammunition, and cryptocurrency, as long as these purchases adhere to federal and state laws and regulations. In addition, while ICCU's e-branch services can be used to make tax and court-ordered payments, including child support, we do not recommend using them for these activities. Instead, we advise that members leverage government and state payment portals to ensure timely delivery. Idaho Senators Mike Crapo and Jim Risch have joined other Republican senators in Congress to pass an act allowing interstate gun sales. If the act is passed, people could buy and sell guns between state lines. Currently, under federal regulations, you can't sell or deliver firearms to anyone who doesn't live in the state where the gun licensee's business is. The Open Primaries Initiative is officially on the November ballot. 
The Idaho Secretary of State's office says the group, Idahoans for Open Primaries, got enough signatures for their initiative to appear on the ballot. The initiative proposes a nonpartisan primary election where the top four candidates, regardless of party, would advance to the general election. The general election would have instant runoff voting, often called ranked choice voting. Voters would choose their top candidate and rank the remaining candidates in order of preference. Another Idahoan is competing in the National Mullet Championship. It's Wilder fourth grader Dylan Jacks Lispy, but he goes by Mad Dog Jacks for the contest. It's not business in the front, rather a party in the front and a three-day party in the back. You can find a link to vote for him on our website, ktpb.com. And that's the 411 on the 208. I'm Hunter Funk. I already mentioned this earlier today. Congressman Simpson, a bit too busy today to speak with us about the provision that he put into that budget bill about the Lava Wind, wind Project. But while he was bringing that budget bill forward as chair of the Subcommittee on Interior, Environment, and Related Agencies, he did find the time to revive a rivalry that goes back nearly 90 years. Who has the best potatoes in the country? Congressman Simpson's colleague from the Pine Tree State, she was ready to push back. The committee will reconvene. What seemed like Second another business today is consideration of the interior environment and related agencies. Boring old beginning to another meeting of the House Appropriations Committee. I'll now recognize Chairman Simpson to present the bill. Quickly took a turn. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Toward and talk of tubers. I wait till everybody's here so they know that we're having a little contest today, but it's not really. Congressman a Mike Simpson of Idaho because we've got Maine was dead set on uh, defending our stature. They say potato chips 
but they're really tuber chips. As supreme when it comes to spuds. Because if it's a potato, it had to be grown in Idaho. That's why we put some Idaho potato chips out there so that you can compare what a tuber chip is versus a potato chip. Um, it's not uncommon to have congressional rivalries. You know, it's kind of a nice uh, bipartisan thing that you often do. I'm not going to sue for false advertising. Yeah, but right. with um, Congressman Simpson and I. That's that's part of the bill. It usually right, gets right down to potatoes and whatever you choose. Which is why the good lady from Maine. And in close Closing, should there be any question about whose potatoes are more authentic? <clears throat> Would not go quietly. Any potato chip is a great meal, and these are a really cute little bag. I know you will all find that ours are better. Um, <laughs> Congresswoman Shelley Pingree stands by her statement today. Because, as you can imagine, Idaho thinks they own the potato. And we kind of do, now. The great potato wars have begun. <laughs> But that actually began decades ago with a challenge from the up-and-comer tuber state of Idaho in 1937. Back then, believe it or not, Maine was the primary producer of potatoes in America, popping out $17 million worth to Idaho's seven. Well, that didn't stop the gem state governor, Barzilla Clark, from declaring Idaho's already famous potatoes as the best in the nation and sending hundreds of crates of Idaho potatoes to DC to prove it. Maine's delegation would not back down, saying a Maine potato would be humiliated if his eyes saw an Idaho potato in the same oven. Well, this debate would be decided in the House dining room with a carb-loaded lunch on December 7th. But the judges from Puerto Rico, the Philippines, Alaska, and Hawaii, well, they failed to come to a conclusion, a half-baked decision that ended in a draw. It didn't look as if they were trying, exclaimed the Boston Globe. Anybody ought to be able to tell those potatoes from Aroostook were the best, said Maine's Congressman Ralph Brewster. Idaho's David Clark countered with, those judges must have paralyzed pallets. Um, Congresswoman Pingree remembers her history. Until 1957, Maine more potatoes than Idaho. But these days, the spud spar continues. Pardon me, ma'am. Are those real Maine potatoes? Commercially. I work here. Whatever that is. We're farmers and we grow it. And congressionally. Did anybody decide? Was there a decision? Oh, well, in my opinion, everyone liked the Maine potatoes better. And I thought that the potatoes from Idaho were very good and a really cute little package. Um, but we we just kind of smoked them out. We brought far more varieties. We really just loaded up the tables with every possible kind of Maine potato chip. Tough battle to go up against a potato state, though. We'll give you that. You grow a lot more potatoes than we do, but ours are exquisitely good. And we have potatoes and lobsters. So this time of year, you're on the beach having a potato and a lobster. Kind of can't go wrong. We do have crayfish, though, like they're invasive, but we have a few, which That's is kind thing. of like it's, it's like an Idaho lobster. It's about this big. <laughs> yeah, I'd, I'd hate to have to do a taste test on that one between my lobsters and crayfish. I just I'd, I'd take Mike's word for it if I had to. Until then, Congressman Pingree plans to keep the russet rivalry running with Congressman Simpson. He hasn't really been able to challenge me for creativity. And maybe there is more out there. I just haven't seen it yet. But I think we can out potato you guys pretty much any day of the week on our creative uses of the potato. Challenge accepted, Congresswoman. What led to Idaho overtaking Maine and the rest of the country for potato production in the 1950s? That'd be the creation of the Idaho Potato Commission in 1937. And of course, J.R. Simplot and his pension for undercutting potato prices back then. Congresswoman Pingree did mention all the other varieties they grow in Maine's Arosta County, or just the county, as the locals call it. She mentioned the colors that they grow, the fingerling potatoes, how they turn their tubers into vodka and donuts. I mean, we do the vodka thing. I don't know if we do the donut thing, though. She told us she's open to taste test on the vodka anytime. So I guess now the ball or potato is in Congressman Simpson's court. Like fries with that? Yes, please. Really good fries? Yes. Fries made from Maine potatoes? Yes. Locally grown Maine potatoes? Yes, already. Well, come and get them. Our work here is done. We're farmers and we grow it. And while you enjoy another spud spot from Maine, remember, we want to hear what you have to say about the show. Text us 208 321 5614. And don't forget your name and the hashtag the 208.